we have great speakers today in panels and in keynotes, and we're going to kick it off to start with Jody Forlizzi, our first um, keynote speaker. She is the Herbert A. Simon Professor in Computer Science and HCI, and um, presumably because she has copious free time. She also has, is the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University. We're thrilled to have you, Jody. All right, good morning, everybody, and thanks for that introduction. Um, as you heard, I am a professor at CMU in the Human Computer Interaction Institute, and I also do work in diversity, equity, and inclusion, another uh, use of my design skills. So I'm a designer by training, and I design and study the impacts of AI and automation in many forms, including assistive robots, automation, and algorithms that track and manage workers. I've had a long career as the first design faculty in a school of computer science. So today, I want to speculate a little bit more on my core discipline of design and where it needs to go. Harold Nelson talks about accidental vagrants, which are animals that thrive in contexts where they have not traditionally been. For example, land birds living on the water. These accidental vagrants serve as creative and innovative solutions for positive change within an ecosystem. And so it is with me, a scholar of service design and systems design, working within human AI automation. And along with Hoda Hadari and Raid Ghani, I'm on the executive leadership team of the CMU RAI Center. And our vision is that we must design, develop, and deploy responsible AI to promote accountability and equitable social outcomes. So we want to develop AI that has positive impact in the real world, and that has both internal and external facing missions. Externally, we want to raise the visibility of our work. And internally, we want a better scope understand the scope and scale of the research we're doing, and foster new collaborations around these three pillars. Research, translating research, whether basic, applied, or evaluative, into practical and policy impact. Education, offer education to our students, community members, and individuals working in the community. And then policy impact, develop materials to inform policy and bargaining. And we have some cross-cutting activities, including partnerships with government, industry, and nonprofit. And we try to have events to um, strengthen our communities, such as problem and opportunity sessions and policy salons. So all of this is to realize the goal of creating, deploying, and increasing awareness of responsible AI in academia, various industry sectors, and society. So there's a lot of AI research going on in the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon and beyond. And here are some of our emerging topics and themes. And some of the efforts include things like exploring the challenges that machine learning developers face in practice when addressing issues of fairness in the systems they develop, or addressing variations in dialect, vocabulary, and speech mechanics that confuse today's smart speakers and conversational agents or understanding how people organically come together to collectively audit algorithms to understand how platforms like Yelp recommend our system works, or testifying to the House Financial Services Committee Task Force on AI on equitable algorithms, examining ways to reduce AI bias in financial services. But today I'm going to pivot a little bit and talk about some of my own research in this area of responsible AI for social good. And I would like to start with the idea that, of course, computing technologies continue to change the world at a rapid pace. So it's true we're in a sea change in technology, from the personal computer to continuous sensing, VR, AR, Internet of Things, technology evolves at a rapid pace. And a plethora of data has been generated. And of course, people have benefited greatly from these developments, ranging from information transfer to crowdsourcing and beyond. But as James mentioned, there's also been shortcomings, for example, in hate speech, fake news, and the ability to operationalize on online platforms. So writers at The Economist decreed that data in this century is what oil was to the last one. And it's true, data has enabled new products, services, businesses, and economies. But at Google Alphabet, they've likened AI to electricity, saying it can make humans more productive than we've ever imagined. 
but other researchers have warned that we should today encounter AI like our ancestors encountered fire. If we manage it well, it will become a tremendous force for global good, but if we deploy it too quickly and without foresight, AI will burn in ways that we cannot control, and I really, really like that metaphor. So today, machine learning and AI affect so many aspects of what designers touch, ranging from web-based services to conversational UIs to social media platforms and learning systems. And these technologies support a huge array of products and systems. For example, AI helps judges decide whether criminal defendants should be detained or released while awaiting trial. AI assists child protection agencies in screening referral calls. And AI helps employers filter job resumes. And AI enables facial recognition, which can be used for all kinds of things, including surveillance and crime prevention. So data, ML, and AI are affecting everything that we design. And it's really confusing for designers. So one helpful construct might be first understanding what we design. As technology continues to advance and sensing and data become more abundant, it's hard to understand this sometimes. So for example, conversational UIs like Amazon Alexa and Google Home can be thought of as products, but they're actually services. They're running a, a, a service, an AI-driven service underneath. So one helpful test to understand whether something is a product or a service is a transfer of value. So products are things that are owned by someone who not, did not design or build the product. And businesses get value in manufacturing products when they do things like optimizing production, reducing logistics, innovating, or broadening their suite of offerings. But this can get confusing because software is a product. Maybe some people in the room remember buying Microsoft Office on a big box of DVDs. And these are intangible products that are disruptive in that they can be pirated or copied or made again and again. So services are not the same as products. They're intangible. They require the presence of a provider and a customer. And they're created at the time that the service is needed. Traditional service examples are things like banking, hospitality, healthcare, frontline services in retail, beauty, and healthcare. So notice there's often many products within a service, and these form product service ecologies. So for example, Starbucks is a service, but the cup of coffee they provide is a product that the customer purchases and owns. Starbucks is a service that delivers a product in a form and time and place that customers desire. The performance is the making and delivery of the custom coffee that you've ordered. And in many places, Starbucks serves as a third place, a place between home and work. And in many places in the world, you can walk into a Starbucks and instantly feel that familiar setting. So it's, it's a global feeling. And Starbucks is also successfully driving commodities into other domains, such as home and airplanes. So the world then has transitioned from manu manufacturing products to providing services. This graphic from the New York Times chronicles the shift in our economy from products to services in the last few decades. On the left-hand side, around 1960, you can see that the largest, most profitable companies in the US were product-producing companies like GM, Ford, and Esso. But then around 2010, we had a sea change, and the largest, most profitable companies in the US were now service delivery companies, companies like Walmart, Kelly, and IBM. And even though these kinds of businesses sell commodities, they think of their offering as a service offering to get customers the goods they need. And so this is a really big pivot for my discipline of design, because this suggests that service design, a discipline where we consider multiple stakeholders, is needed here to ensure that the experiences are consistent, pragmatic, purposeful, and even ethical across all components of the system. So another helpful construct is the idea that products and services are blending. Servitization comes from adding services to products, such as IKEA, who added home delivery and build services based on customer request. And productization is when we add products to service experiences. For example, Warby Parker, which added physical stores to its online experiences to give welcoming customer experiences around buying glasses. 
Another construct is that of datafication or data animation. So data can be added to products resulting in the plethora of smart products that we see, everything from wa water bottles to mattresses. Data can be added to services, and this is an active area for a AI and ML, making predictions, customizing, making recommendations. And data can be added to product service ecologies, resulting in things like holistic sleep systems, where you might have wearables, apps, environmental devices, and even incentive programs for working on sleep. And so this is where it gets really interesting for designers, because I believe most people working in the discipline of design lack the processes and tools to readily innovate with machine learning and AI. And in addition, impacts of these technologies are understudied from design to implementation and training to, and rollout. And this is because designing with these technologies is different. And traditional design processes like the double diamond you see here or Hugh Dubberley's uh, diagram on the right may not apply. The playing field is really different, and some of the research we've been doing at CMU shows that we need to innovate with machine learning and AI to create products that people will want. We need engineers who can develop custom models for specific applications. We need developers who will integrate AI in their application development and deploy AI. And we need the technicians who will utilize and maintain AI. And all of these are needed in the design process, and they need to have different and complementary skills. So there have been a few efforts to design new systemic design curricula, motivated by the reality that design is changing, and designers today are facing fundamentally different problems than they did even five years ago. And some individuals and organizations have made specific audits and recommendations for curriculum change, such as the Institute of Design and Dubberly Design Studio, whose curriculum uh, on the right is a model as exemplar, and it was based on the curriculum of HFG Alm many decades ago. So I want to talk about some of the application of these broader design skills and some of our research on AI and automation in the hospitality industry. Labor industry experts predict that technology has the potential to automate more tasks in the hospitality industry than any other industry. And large numbers of hospitality workers are being displaced by these technological changes. During the pandemic, which really forced contact-free um, interaction, it was estimated that nearly 90% of hospitality workers faced unemployment. And the unemployment rates continue to be high due to this shift, demand, and acceptance of contact-free services. So our research team is examining this change and studying interventions and actions to help workers, employers, and technology to be successful across this change. Today in the hospitality industry, robots meet, greet, clean, assist in surveillance, transport, and deliver products and services to people staying in the hotels. Robots are making food, delivering it to tables and clearing tables. So here you see Flippy flipping burgers, Chippy making french fries, Sally making salad, and Sippy making drinks. But robots are only a small part of the technology landscape in hospitality. In addition to robots, we have AI, VR and AR, IoT, smart rooms, smart sensors, big data, little data, biometrics and facial recognition, and conversational UIs. And these systems track demand, not only at the customer level, but in terms of operations, reservations, volume, pricing, inventory, competition. And technology is transforming every part of hospitality, including customer experience, the definition of service, the numbers and types of jobs, and the experience of the workers in terms of tasks, workflow, and work volume, and skill requirements. But many of these are really hastily considered design. And there's even less consideration for the implementation, rollout, training, and study of the impact of the workforce. So our work seeks to create an opportunity for workers to envision, design, and engage in worker-oriented research around the future of automation in the hospitality industry. And we're working with Unite Here, the largest hospitality union in the US, 
to ensure that worker satisfaction, voice, safety, ownership, and agency go hand in hand with an understanding of future technology and future work. So hospitality is what is known as invisible work because a lot of times people staying in a hotel or having an experience in a casino don't really see what's going on. It's a physically demanding job done mostly by women who are largely immigrants and women of color. And house, as employers move from daily housekeeping, which is gone since the pandemic, housekeepers' work is becoming harder. In a checkout, they do a deep clean of the room. They change the sheets, they vacuum, they scrub, they turn it from top to bottom as opposed to in a stayover when cleaning is much simpler. It might be emptying the trash, making the bed, and just refreshing the toiletries. In some hotels, housekeepers are assigned sections, so every day they clean the same set of rooms. And the assignment of rooms was traditionally done with a clipboard, and so the term of art is known as the board. So even with digital services, people refer to the board. Digitalizing hospitality deprives housekeepers of a lot of the autonomy in their work. It tells them which room to do next based on an algorithm. Workers can't always see their whole board, their entire list. It requires some technology literacy to use. And the board can change over the course of the day. But there's also advantages to these systems. It enables faster communication between housekeepers and other operations, such as managers, engineering, and repairs. But what usually happens is with an algorithm, there's a rational room sequencing and therefore an extreme workload. So in the panel on the left, you can see this large multi-wing hotel. And the black path would be the most direct path to be cleaning a set of assigned rooms. But instead, we have this dashed line where the algorithm is making the worker go from end to end of the wing, upstairs and downstairs, moving a very heavy cart. And another thing that happens, as you can see on the right, is that someone is assigned many, many checkouts. So they have a lot of physical work all in a row, and it might be too much work for the hospitality worker. So in the past three years, we built a relationship with the union, running workshops with housekeepers, bartenders, and cocktail waitresses. And we first explored these algorithmic managers and these co-robots that are replacing some jobs and transforming others that can't really be completely automated, the high-touch, face-to-face interaction of hospitality service. Our workshops revealed workers' values in their hospitality work, the desire to provide this high-touch service that they are expert at, and that they get tipped for, so part of their pay. Some of them had over 25 years of experience in their current role. Some expressed a desire to collaborate with and help members of their team who were less literate with technology. And they all had pride and accountability and responsibility for a job well done. We also saw strong evidence of labor shifting with both technologies. In both cases, these automation systems created more labor for certain hospitality workers and reduced their ability to, to perform the social and emotional labor that they desire. So for example, several casinos had replaced bartenders with automated bartending systems. And people described these as science experiments. Cocktail waitresses talked about the poor quality of the drinks, the need to shuffle drink orders to avoid contamination, and the idea that they couldn't complete their rounds as quickly because they were waiting for the machine. And therefore, they get less tips. Hospitality workers also express frustration at a lack of training in using automation systems, new and greater impositions of management on the agency with which they formerly did their jobs, and the need to constantly apologize to the customers and attempt to mitigate the negative impacts of these systems. So social science literature on automation has traditionally focused on job displacement, for example, in manufacturing with robots. It's not a simple one-to-one -one mapping. We don't simply replace tasks with automation. And furthermore, there's not a lot of empirical evidence about how this unfolds and what the changes mean. More recent literature highlights complexity, especially in the service sector. Specific skills can be challenging to automate, and whole aspects of work processes change. And in the hospitality industry, it's even more complex because 
a hotel can be owned, managed, and branded by three different organizations. So this fractioning can affect whether basic minimal effort, such as low road implementation of AI takes place, or if change managers are utilized to provide a more experiential, high road, robust implementation of technology. So enter design research. I want to touch on a few ways that design research and design methods are at play in this work. Researchers including Steve Barley and Diane Bailey have called for a broader investigation of technology in the workplace. And this is a key place to operationalize systemic design. They argue for extending to the left to understand issues of power and ideology, and to the right to understand broader organizational issues. And so while ethnographers and social scientists might focus on behavior, or HCI and human factors researchers might focus on technology, a better view might be an ecological one centered in system design to look more broadly at this spectrum. So we're using aspects of systemic design to understand the many lenses and biases around this problem and to help organize our team. So using systemic design, we can understand the current state, understand the system around the problematic situation, and look at what cognitive models are driving these. And so in this iceberg model, which you see on the left, the designer looks at the events, but then tries to understand the patterns and structures underneath them. Another skill that we use from design is reframing, which is getting to the assumption behind the assumption. So for example, if you compare Amazon and UPS delivery drivers, you can see that while both do the same job and are monitored similarly, UPS drivers are tre treated quite differently than Amazon drivers. Amazon drivers are managed by algorithms and they're viewed as expendable commodities. There was a case of an Amazon driver in Arizona who was fired for the inability to complete his delivery. He was punished for things apparently that were beyond his control and the company appears to manage its workers algorithmically. But UPS on the other hand empowers and informs its workers substantially more. Data collected by these workers re is reviewed by humans and not algorithms. And if there's an error or a grievance, they have a human-centered process in place for rectifying it. So talking to our guest room attendants, housekeepers, gave an individual or UX perspective of this problem. Talking to the managers gave a broader, more multi-stakeholder perspective from service design. And talking to the manufacturer of the software revealed additional and course conflicting perspectives. Talking to hotel management revealed even additional perspectives in this work. So some of our ongoing questions are, what can we design? Where will it have the most impact? So we'll co-design, prototype, and test. We want to avoid isolationist or biased views of technology. And I think there's a trend in HCI and HAI right now which depicts all technology as a negative force which disempowers workers. And I want to caution against that for a number of reasons. We want to avoid reductionist views of work. We want to look at the differences between minimal implementation of automation and a more robust setting. And we want to take steps towards designing not only new roles, but bargaining information and steps towards policy. And in all of these, we can use systems design and co-design to get to richer ways to unpack these research questions. Some of the other ways that we use design in our large multidisciplinary team include rectifying research questions and looking at the demands of field work among this huge team avoiding isolationist views of technology and reductionist views of work, and taking these steps forward. So our approach in this project has been leveraged to help CMU fulfill a larger obligation to create opportunities for workers and labor organizations to participate in technology innovation. So we're responding to this emergence emerging consensus among policymakers that innovation and technology development are strategic initiatives for our country. So this summer, the president signed the CHIPS and Science Act to establish a technology strategy with guidance from a new National Science Foundation directorate on technology, innovation, and partnership known as TIP. And this legislature names universities, industry, government, and labor organizations as four critical stakeholders in the technology directorate. 
Design research has been formative in the university's engagement with the labor movement across a number of efforts across campus. And I'm proud to say that design research has been formative in developing a working relationship with the AFL-CIO, its technology institute, and 58 affiliate labor uni unions as representatives of workers across the spectrum. So with the Tech Institute, we're developing this notion of bringing worker voice into the innovation process, ensuring that we use workers, engaging them, collaborating with them to help improve technology development. We bring their voice and labor organizations into the innovation process, and we create a model of labor academic engagement across sectors and communities. So in conclusion, today I tried to talk about how the field of design is changing, how product services and systems are blending, how data is abundant and machine learning and AI is affecting everything that designers touch. I've also talked about how design practice and design research continue to evolve to be applied to more complex problems. It's more than just products and services for us now. In the case study of hospitality automation, it's also about understanding this really complex situation around workers and their actual or perceived vulnerability to AI and automation and the many impacts that surround them, including history, context, economics, labor management relationships, politics, and more. And then finally, I've tried to show how design can be critical in designing socially responsible AI. We design things like new training materials, new interfaces, but we also design information, policies, communications, even material for bargaining, all with the intent of improving the experience of workers and other stakeholders. So thanks for listening. I want to thank my funders, my collaborators, my students, and the people who give me ideas, all of you. So thanks for listening. Let me just start out. How do, um, I was very surprised that you kind of implied that the design field wasn't quite ready for this revolution. And, and, and I just want to probe that a little bit because I felt like, for example, architects are, are looking at individual lives and also the community. And so, so tell me a little bit more about why, why that big surprise came. Sure, I think that uh, in most design training around the world, um, we are not training students to think about AI in appropriate ways. So designers can make beautiful things that people desire, but they don't know what to do with AI. And often data scientists and technologists can make elegant technical things, but they may not be the right product. So we need to find a way to build those bridges. Um, one of the things we've done in our teaching at CMU is to talk about the using AI as a design material, looking at its capabilities. So we're trying to reframe and develop designers who are more ripe to work with data scientists and other technologists. So, so this is related to a question I had actually for you, which was over the last 10 or 15 years, design has gotten a seat at the table in Silicon Valley. You know, Airbnb and these other examples have led to designers being key to founding teams. We've seen key designers like Irene Al have a partnership at Coastal Ventures to bring those people in. And at the same time, design tools like Sketch and Figma have really allowed designers to explore designs and be able to communicate to engineers what they want. AI seems to me like it's changed that in a way in that this is a technology that there isn't easy ways for designers to really express what they want. Is this leading to some difficulty in that progress that we've seen. Yes, I think that's absolutely the case. And I, you know, let me put my futurist hat on and say, let's look at the field in five years and see what's happening. I, I think we're on the brink of a recession. I think lots of people are losing their jobs. There's going to be a shuffle in who can get employed and where. And um, at the same time, the things we're designing and managing as products are more complex. So we were talking about this yesterday, um, Hugh Dubberly, John Kane, and I, we were talking about fast and slow design and how design is going to slow down and designers will need to become more managers. They'll have to manage many more streams within the um, innovation, creation, and implementation of a project. 
As promised, I want to go to the audience. Uh, my name is Jonathan, and I have a question for uh, Professor Jody. So I, I'm interested in uh, you know, your discussion on the uh, AI in the hospitality uh, industry. Uh, I'm just being curious, uh, the level of adoption today um, and, and its variation among you know, the high-end hospitality versus low-end, U.S. versus Asia versus international. Great. So the question is, what are the comparisons of automation adoption across properties and across the world? So I can't speak for other cultures. We're studying in the U.S. right now, but yes, you know, we've all gone on YouTube and watched the videos about the robot hotels and um, much more social acceptance of tracking and awareness of who you are as a customer. You know, we're not quite there in the U.S. yet. The, the situation in U.S. hospitality is fragmentation. So you can have a brand like Hyatt that commits to using product XYZ to help its housekeepers and operations. And even in different Hyatts, the rollout, study, and existence of other systems will be very different. And as I said in my talk, there's not a lot of empirical research. So I think this is a ripe area to try to understand what's going on. Thanks. Now we'll go to this one. So I, I have two questions, one technical, one non-technical. I'll ask the technical one first. Okay. Thanks for a great talk. It, it appears to me that when you're working with uh, blue-collar workers in very large numbers, whose experience might vary, from person to person, that an algorithm like reinforcement, reinforcement learning that would be used to train an optimizer, such as you described, would want to incorporate feedback from many unreliable sources rather than one trusted one, which is the norm in reinforcement learning. Do you have any thoughts on how the algorithms might need to change to better adapt to your work? I think that's a very elegant suggestion to think about reinforcement learning in this space. What I can tell you is, there's barely any AI. It's so uh, on the cusp of nothing. So I think there's a ripe <laughs> opportunity to use even simple, robust AI here. Furthermore, they have many interconnected systems that don't talk to each other, and they're sticky. So they'll get new things, and the old things are still in evidence. So we sat in meetings with managers looking at 10 to 15 applications to track hotel operations. So. It's, it's really low level, but that's a great idea. Thank you. Thanks. Just, just a quick question. Today is the day of strike among white collar workers in the UC system. And I wondered. Uh, I saw a few in here. Uh, <laughs> Eric. <no. laughs> I wondered how your ideas carry over from blue collar to white collar work. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I've been so immersed in hospitality that it might be hard to make direct comparisons, but one thing I can say is, in the field of design, there's a lot of call right now for participatory design to empower these people or fix these people, and I think this is an area where we haven't really pushed. So yes, we can advance participatory design and collect the voices of stakeholders, but how? I think that's a really interesting research question and another that I'm interested in, and perhaps in that we could find a way to transcend other groups. Thanks. Question? So this is fantastic. Uh, I'm Melissa Coity with Finreg Lab. We're a DC-based research organization. And first of all, when you made the comment and showed the picture of the two trucks, I texted my brother, who's in administration management at UPS, and said, you should be feeling good. <laughs> you know, UPS is more kind, perhaps, in their management of the drivers. And then it occurred to me, and this gets to my question, actually, for all of you, um, what is going to motivate in terms of ultimately requiring some level of governance around how humans are being brought into consideration? So I'm in financial services policy. We have laws and regulations that dictate if you're using machine learning for credit decisioning, you have to be able to explain it to a consumer mm -hmm. why a decision was reached. You have to evaluate for fairness in, in a disparate impact assessment. But I hear and I see in many of these other sectors, especially medicine, we were having a conversation this morning where you know a tool may be developed, but the data or the population that it's in, then deployed upon doesn't even represent. And I just, I love that what you're building is from the ground up and working with 
unions and, and labor organizations. My guess, my question is, where is the, where's the motivation going to be? Is it going to ultimately come from the ground up? Where's the power? It's the power question that I think ultimately is good to spend more time on. So I would love to hear all of you all opine on that. I mean, coming from D.C. My, and, and U.S. government, my instinct would be, when are regulators really leaning in in a more aggressive way on this? Would you all say back to me, wait, industry and these different sector and applications don't feel like we know enough around the smart, responsible use of AI? How do you all think about that and where are you landing? Because frankly, I've been watching high grow for the past two and a half years. I'm glad we're having this conversation, but we were also trying to have this conversation two years ago. So where are we? Great question. Uh, I'll speak to the work I've been doing in hospitality and then let others chime in with their expertise. But, um, you know, it, going to the AFL-CIO conference this summer and watching group after group stand up who had protested, unionized themselves, Amazon workers, uh, the staff at University Arts, my alma mater, um, gives me faith that people are, you know, it's an activist moment. People are speaking up and they have structures of the AFL-CIO to help them. But I also think we need top-down, we need regulation, we need, for the, the literature I've been collecting on worker surveillance is scant. You know, we need a lot more research here and then we need action from above. So I'm happy about TIP, you know, I'm happy about the CHIPS Act. I think we need more. Um, I'm sure you could speak to other Joe, domains. Common on medicine. Yeah, so um, I work in healthcare and I, I actually work very closely with the FDA and they've been um, remarkably careful about not diving in uh, to, an, to an empty pool. Um, <laughs> by the way, the cusp of nothing, quote of the day so far. Um, <laughs> uh, so so in, in, in healthcare, they, they, the, the regulatory agency that I'm most familiar with is being very careful because they're very aware that, the, that it's not clear what to do, that they could squash uh, innovation if they're not careful, and they could get a huge firestorm of, of, of complaints from their, from their sometimes a very influential uh, vendors uh, if they are, are, are too heavy handed. And so I do think that academic right now is the answer. We have to create the evidence base so that policymakers have something to actually go on because right now they're on the cusp of nothing, if I, if I may borrow that phrase. Sure thing. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if I were going to comment on what is going on at HCI, we have a, a really uh, good policy team and they're working with folks in, in Sacramento and Washington. I mean, one thing we noticed is a lot of the folks there simply don't have the knowledge to be able to make regulation. We've seen this in embarrassing quotes from senators and hearings, et cetera. So one thing we've done is we've had staff come here for education on AI so they at least have basic knowledge to do the right things. I think that's the first step. Right. But uh, we had a question on the um, virtual uh, Slido right. from Six who says, as an HCI person who's worked for a trade union for five years, I really enjoyed both of these talks. What do you see as the role for HCI and computing researchers in policy development in this area, especially at the state and national level? So I thought, yeah, what, what, what do you think HCI people should do? Not HCI, human computer yeah. interactions. Yeah, thank you, Russ. Well, Not I, necessarily the, you know, policy experts. I think, uh, James, you hit it on the head, which is to uh, bring in knowledge about AI working with it, humans interacting with it, to help make those policy briefs, to help inform you know, the, the audience, to help bring the arguments up. I think that's really important. I'm sure you have ideas too. <laughs> yeah, well, I definitely think you know, we're a field that's about connecting the different pieces, whether it's social sciences, technologists, HCI, people are often in the middle, and I think we can do that same thing with policy folks as all, also being a translator between areas. I think we'll bounce between humans and virtual question okay. now. Let's go to a human. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Anoop, and I love the human intelligence in this conference. So, uh, so uh, I'm very interested in the convergence between uh, creators, and I think uh, the, there are three schools of thoughts or three mindsets here. One, one are the designers, 
Uh, one are the technologists and then the business professionals. Um, so what do you suggest from your research and learning as to what is the best way to get them to work together uh, and with AI, thinking about AI evolving from it's taking over the world to, oh, it's going to help us and it's going to augment us. So what do you think as the best avenue to do that? To get business technologists and HCI people talking together? Uh, designers, technologists, and any business creators, all, all, all of them actually working together to get what we need. Great. I, I, you know, I, I think getting the disciplines together to work and study. So for example, at CMU, we have a master's of product management, which is uh, a blend between computer science and business. Uh, those students take some design courses. Uh, they go out in the world, they practice in internships, and you know, slowly we're changing the field. I, I think um, placing the right interdisciplinary leaders at, at certain strategic points is critical. We actually see that in our students somewhat too. So like many other schools, a, uh, our AI track in computer science is by far the most popular. Yeah. But many of those people do a master's where they'll do HCI or vice versa, they did their undergraduate in HCI and then do a master's in AI. So we're seeing a lot of people who want to connect these together to make the products they work on more effective. Just as a follow-up to that, how do the employers feel about the close connection with the unions and the AFL-CIO in, in your work? Is that a uh, showstopper for them or do they engage? It's mixed. I mean, that's the best thing I can say. Okay. Some, some fear that we're going to tell them that uh, they're, they're being surveilled or some fear that we're going to tell them that the technology is bad. So, you know, it's a careful pitch and then a very long waiting time as it moves up and down in our organization. People feel like, oh, you know, we, we really need to look at the pros and cons of this. And then the other uh, time element is where they are in deploying this technology. Of course, ideally, we'd like to get matched cases where there's a property without and a property with, but there's really very little symmetry in the industry, so. Hi, uh, can you hear me? So I'm Neil Sundares, and I work in large language models for software development productivity. So our audience is uh, software developers, and we've learned the hard way that uh, UX is an important aspect of AI when we deploy AI, uh, especially when we interfere with developers when they're in an analytical mind frame. Very similar to what you're talking about, your uh, hospitality workers. So one thing we talk a lot about in making this effective, so I, I call UX the last mile of making AI work, um, but probably for you, in your case, it's a first mile, I don't know. Um, we talk a lot about AB experimentation. You didn't mention that at all. So when humans are involved so much, how do you think of AB experimentation? So somebody talked about reinforcement learning, but here you could run an experiment of a good enough model and see how humans behave. Are they more productive, less productive, more happy, less happy, et cetera. But what, what yes, do you think I, I, I thank you for your question. I think A-B experimentation is important, and there is certainly a role for it. The reason why I didn't mention it today is the research that we have been doing has been at such a small scale. Um, we haven't been privy to a lot of data sets. Uh, we are working very right now, you know, very much from the bottom up in small groups. But I think this is a really valuable method. Thanks. I'm afraid that we um, that's the end of our session. I know there's questions waiting, and I apologize very much. Uh, this has been a great session, and we thank should you. move to the next one. And let's thank, thank Jody again. Thank you. Thanks.